Um, man, worship was good this morning. I echo, I don't know if Nate's still here. Worship was good this morning. The presence of God can be real sweet as we worship, as we spend time. And we're actually going to take a few moments here and I'm going to dive into a message that I did prepare. Um, but we're going to take a few moments and take a few minutes, actually. And I just really felt this on my heart today uh, for this time. And this, we're going to spend some time praying together. And, 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 and you'll see in a second. And we don't always have to be in the, the prayer time of the service to pray. We don't always have to have wonderful piano music playing in the background to pray, though those are great things. And I just felt in my spirit as I was thinking, as I was preparing, um, and I even sense this of thinking about how the Lord's encountering us in worship, that there are some real heavy things people walked in with today. That there are burdens that are symbolically on your back, that you walked into this chapel carrying. And the second thing is, I think there's some people in your life that you know are walking through some stuff. Some people that you care so deeply about. And people that you want to see God move, you want to see the Holy Spirit intervene, and we want to pray. And one of the things I find so funny about Christian culture sometimes, here at Northwest, but it's just in general, Western Christian culture maybe, is we, we want to pretend we have it all together. And I understand theologically maybe where someone's coming from when they say that, of Christ saved us and we're new, and, and I fully agree with that. But man, we pretend and we put on this face, and I'm not going to let any, we tell ourselves, I can't let anybody see what I'm going through. We tell ourselves, man, I can't let so-and-so know that I'm struggling with this sin, because if they did, oh, they're not going to love me. Man, if they knew that this hardship's going through my life and I'm more defeated than I am encouraged, they're going to think I'm a bad Christian. And those are just lies from the enemy. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is it puts myself, you, and us all on the exact same playing field. Friends, we all need Jesus. Every single one of us need Jesus. There is no superiority, and what I'm so against, and that sounds harsh, but I'm so against the, the Christian fakeness. Man, I'm so against the, the pretend to have it all together, the, the judging other people's spiritual faith, the thinking of yourself less or, or worse than other people. Man, that's the complete opposite of everything Jesus stands for and calls for us, but we so easily do it. And I've been there. I'm not, I'm not trying to judge you in that statement. I have been there. I've done that. And I don't think that's God's heart for us, because some days we just need Jesus. Some days we're just walking through things. Some days people that we care so deeply about are having the hardest time in life, and we want to intercede for them. And so we're going to spend just a few minutes, um, and I really encourage you to be bold in it, to be vulnerable in it, but I'm going to have two different kind of groups of people just stand up to be prayed over. If you are carrying something and you walked in here and, and the Holy Spirit speaks and by evidence of that, you know exactly what you're carrying when I say that. When I said you walked in here with something, you thought of what that was, you know what that is, you know the Holy Spirit brought that to the forefront of your mind. You might not have been thinking about it. That is the, the Holy Spirit speaking to you, speaking in you, God working with you. And if you came in this morning, I just, I just felt this on the Lord to, to do this because I think sometimes... Moments like that are equally as important as hearing a great, a great word from the Lord. But if that's you, I just got this picture of just dropping it to the Lord. I know we just sang that in worship. Just drop it. And so my encouragement is if you stand, it's going to be this symbolic, God, I've been carrying this weight, and I'm going to drop it right at your feet and stand on up. I, just, I had that picture so clearly. God, I've been carrying this weight. I've been carrying this burden. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I know, that I know people personally that I know are walking through very hard times right now. And it's that, God, I trust you and I'm going to stand up. That's the first group of people. Second group of people are, you want to stand up on behalf of somebody. You want to stand up 
for somebody that you deeply love, you deeply care about, that you know is walking through something, and you're like, God, I want to stand up because I, I need, I want you, and I pray, and I intercede for them. I mean, both groups are going to stand up at the same time. We're not going to be judging anybody, and don't feel any pressure to stand by any means because we're going to be the ones praying for people, praying for the ones that are. There's no pressure to stand. There's no pressure to not stand. It's God. I need to stand because I'm walking through this, and I'm not going to worry about what anybody else is thinking. Or God, I want to stand because this person who I deeply love is going through this. Does that make sense? Am I making sense here? And so, we're well, going to take a few minutes. And if that's you, all across the room, if you're like, God, this is what I'm carrying. I need prayer for this. And if God, I know this person's walking through something, and I want to intercede for them, would you just stand up right now? No pressure. I don't care if it's two. I don't care if it's everybody. And that symbolism of God, when I stand up, if it's for you personally, God, I I left it right on the ground because I trust you, because I believe in you, because I put my hope in you, and you give new life. And if you're not standing, don't even feel bad for a second. We're going to stretch out our hands, and we're going to intercede, and we're going to pray for our sisters and our brothers. And if you're standing for somebody, use that time to be praying for that person you're standing for, to be praying for that person that you are interceding on behalf of. Because God wants to touch them. They might be in this room and they might be standing two rows behind you. I don't know. They might be back home. You know who it is. The Holy Spirit brought it to your mind. We're going to take moments. And like Nathan said earlier, feel free to be praying on your own. I'm going to pray over us and I believe the Lord's going to encourage and use that. But if you're sitting, would you stretch out a hand? Would you put a hand on somebody? If you know what somebody's walking through, would you be praying for that? And sometimes the best prayer, we often confuse ourselves. Sometimes the best prayer is just, yes, Lord, amen. God, I believe that. I want to see that happen. Lord, I'm, and that's the most filled with faithful prayer you could be praying. Jesus says you don't always need to do these long, elaborate prayers. Filled with faith, saying, yes, Jesus. God, I need you. God, I'm, I'm broken. I know you save me, but I need you in this situation. You don't even need to pray more than that. You could just pray that over and over again. And we're just going to spend a few moments here, and then we'll jump in. And, but I just, I felt the Lord so strongly say there's people carrying stuff. And he doesn't want you to be carrying. He wants to take it from you. So let's spend a few minutes here praying and feel free if you're standing or sitting to be praying as well. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are so faithful, God, to meet us and to encourage us. And so I just pray right now, God, for my sisters and my brothers that are walking through difficult situations right now. Jesus, would you meet them in that situation? Would you bring your love? Would you bring your peace? Would you bring your joy? Would you bring your hope that we just talked about? Because, God, you are so faithful. God, nothing catches you off guard. And you have been walking with them in the moment. God, one of the things, God, that we just thank you for is that you're not a God who's distant, who's far off. You're a God who's in the midst of the trouble. You're a God who's in the midst of the pain. You're a God who comes and welcomes brokenness. You stand in the midst of it right with us. And you bring hope and you bring life. God, you breathe your spirit into us. And so right now, Jesus, God, it doesn't have to be the part of the service. It doesn't have to be the most holy sounding moment. But God, would you bring your life, would you bring your spirit into, God, the students that are standing, that have been carrying weights. God, you want to bring freedom. You want to bring life. You want to bring wholeness. God, you want to bring hope. You want to bring finances. God, you want to bring, God, you want to say that that diagnosis is no longer there, Jesus. You want to declare wholeness and freedom. And God, for people that are mourning of loved ones that have passed, God, would you touch them? God, in just a tangible, comforting way that only you can do. And God, for people that came in with shame and condemnation, God, you say that, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For you have set us free in the name of Jesus. And so I command that the lies of the enemy that have been spoken over individuals would be gone in the name of Jesus. And God, for my friends that are standing for someone else, man, God, we agree our faith with them for that situation. We thank you for their willingness and their faithfulness to say, I intercede on behalf of so-and-so. I intercede on behalf on their situation. God, would you have a work and have a way in it? Jesus, we need you. And we thank you that you are so faithful and you are a good father who gives good gifts to his children. And God, today we are your children. Every day we are your children. But in this moment, we remember that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Friends, you can grab a seat. 
He doesn't need to be a big spiritual moment to encounter Jesus. It can be. But to encounter his love and to encounter his presence, what he has for you, I'm believing that there are many of us who are walking out of here lighter, who are walking out of here with a burden that you were carrying that Jesus says you do not have to carry. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. And I believe that a lot of you or people you're praying for maybe got a glimpse of that and will walk in that throughout the day. And so I'm excited to, uh, the whole sermon won't be this, you know, somber, I promise, but maybe it will. We'll see how the Lord leads. But, man, I just, sometimes that stuff's more important. I think structure to services is great. And structure in your life is great. Be a disciplined person. We, we schedule our gatherings, but sometimes you just got to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's going to do. You got to make space and sometimes get out of the way or say yes, because God's going to do what God's going to do. And it's going to be a lot easier for you if you uh, say yes to that process rather than resist that process. And so, will I have a shorter sermon because of that? You're welcome, yes. But I think the Holy Spirit encouraged you, and I believe that for you. And so, uh, Hannah mentioned it really briefly. Um, we're starting a relationship series in a. Uh, Oh, people already joked about it. Um, it is absolutely a coinkadink that Valentine's Day is on Monday. <laughs> didn't know that. Honestly, when I was planning this with Pastor Megan, didn't even realize that you'd think I'd know that because the Valentine's Day falls, I believe, on the same day every year. Um, <laughs> honestly, we were just trying to think about series and how they fell with other, other series, but hey, the Holy Spirit works, so if that, you're probably thinking about it, and so it happened to work that way, but that was not our intention. I'll give the Lord any glory or frustration um, about that. Uh, that was not intentional, but the Lord is funny sometimes. He has, he has a sense of humor, and so we're going to talk about a, a mini relationship series that's really just going to be this week, so chapel today, um, just for the next 10, 15 minutes, I have a really kind of brief but straight to the point message that I think the Lord is leading. Um, and then tomorrow night, do not miss it. For this week, again, we're doing the relationship mini-series. There's going to be a panel that Res Life is putting on. And, and so today, I'm not diving into a lot of the relationship topics and questions like boundaries in your relationship or I'm single and I want to be married. How do I wrestle with that tension? Or I don't have this desire to be married, and I'm at a university that only talks about that. How do I process that? Um, all those really, really good questions, and those are great questions, and I don't make any light of any of those questions, and the panel is going to talk about a lot of those tomorrow. So if you have a lot of those, and you're thinking about those things, and you want to process, please go to the panel. Um, the, it's going to be split up between guys and gals. Um, the gals are going to be in Perks Lounge at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Perks Lounge, 7 p.m. Um, and if you don't know where that is, don't even worry about it. Just ask somebody. A lot of people know where it is. Um, and then the guys are going to be in Gray Beatty Lounge at 7 p.m. So if you want to go, Res Life is really excited. There's some great people there. We separated it so you can be more honest and open with the questions that you're going to ask and have really good dialogue from the panelists there. So go to that. Um, 7 p.m. tomorrow. I really encourage you. Make space. Go and enjoy and ask good questions, ask hard questions, process together. And then on Friday, I'm hyped. Um, Arlette is coming to preach here on Friday. I'm hyped. Um, and she has been, uh, Arlette is a AC here and she is in GPC and she's very, very excited. Uh, she's been prepping. Uh, we've been meeting with her just to kind of process the series. And, and she, man, the Lord's got a great message on her heart. Uh, for Friday. Uh, she's going to be uh, just a sneak peek. It's kind of in the community and relationships in the broader sense and unity. And as believers gathering together, how do we do that well? And so she, she's really excited. So if you see her, I know she's in full sermon prep mode right now, but she's really excited. Uh, so she'll be preaching on Friday to wrap up our mini series on relationships. And so don't miss that um, on Friday. Uh, today, uh, I'm really diving into, kind of going to take relationships from a different point of view or a different side of things. I'm going to be really looking at Paul's he Paul here in 1 Corinthians, end of chapter 6, about our relationship with our body. 
at the relationship that and how our body physically interacts with God, what God calls us physically into a relationship, what it means to have a physical body in relationship with Jesus, and then as in a roundabout way, our body physically is what we bring into a relationship. I'm not at all speaking sexually here. I'm, very, I'm speaking incredibly literally. You bring your physical self into a relationship. Friendship, romantic relationship, the way you act, the way your body is, how your body functions. Um, God has something to say about that. Uh, and Paul talks about here, and we're going to read it. On, we're gonna, it's going to be on the screen behind me in just a sec. But I want to get about how, and I just felt... I was going to do a whole sermon on marriage, and maybe the Lord spared you. He didn't need it today. I was, I was thinking about doing that. I was ready for that, and the Lord was like, nope. Uh, and I was doing my sermon prep a while back. The Lord was like, this is what actually I want you to dive into. Uh, and how do we glorify God with our body? Because who we are physically is what we bring into relationships. You bring in your mind mentally. You bring in your emotions and your heart emotionally. And then you bring yourself physically, and God cares about you physically just as much as he cares about you spiritually and emotionally, intellectually. And so we're going to dive into that today. So if you wouldn't mind standing up for the reading of God's word, it's going to be on the screen. You can just follow it right here. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, from verse 12 through verse 20. It says this. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body? For scripture says the two will become one flesh, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against their own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word and your scripture. God, would you speak truth and would you encourage us? Thank you for the way you've already encouraged us and met us. Uh, God, we humbly, God, come before you and say we receive what you have to say, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The, the starting of this kind of section that I just read, uh, Paul's talking to the Corinthians here. And throughout this letter, Paul's addressing different issues and needs in their congregation. And that's very similar probably to how many local congregations would interact today. Issues would come up. A pastor would come and say, hey, I'm going to address this issue that's happening in your church. And so Paul is addressing this. And what the Corinthians were doing, and primarily probably historically speaking, it's most likely the Corinthian men, uh, just to be honest with the text here, um, are justifying their sinful acts. Uh, and the text is pretty plain. Uh, they are going and they are having sex with prostitutes, and they're justifying it. And Paul gives them these two answers that we'll jump into in a sec, uh, but I want to give you a, a funny example. Um, it's slightly embarrassing, but I have myself having justified doing something in my life, and it wasn't a, a sin, though it, I would argue it should have been. Um, it was something that I justified doing, and it was so funny looking back on. But uh, I dyed my hair blonde when I was a junior here at Northwest. And there's a picture of it on the screen. Oh, my goodness. Man. 
Oh, so bad. Man, some people can pull it off and praise the Lord for you. Honestly, and many people are blonde, so I have nothing against being blonde, but I personally just could not do it. And uh, the reason why I justified it was because that the typical answer of my friends were doing it. And I had some really good friends. My buddy, who had been my roommate for my first two years, uh, had got married after our sophomore year, and he's living in the Furs. And so he was up there with his wife, and then me and my buddies don't know why over the summer we're like, we should all dye our hair blonde. So we did it. And I have absolutely no, FOMO was probably the biggest reason. I didn't want to miss out. Um, and I convinced myself and I justified doing something that I just, in my heart of hearts, knew was going to be terrible. Just absolutely, and it did get worse. We just drove to Bartels and just bought the, the box dye right on the shelf um, and just went to my buddy and his wife's apartment in the Furs, and we went into, like, the bathtub, and we just, like, just bleached our hair. It was, oh, it was the worst. And if you have either dyed your hair or if anybody has, like, it got, it was so greasy, and it was, like, plasticky, and it was just the absolute worst experience I've ever had and put my hair through. And my last point out to make it worse is it was so orange, that shouldn't come as a surprise if you know anything about hair dyeing, it was so orange and not blonde that I went back and bought another box dye, went back to my buddy's place and dyed it again to try to take the orange away, and my hair was disgusting. It didn't even feel like hair at that point. It just felt like a plastic doll, and it was disgusting. Um, and the, the, the picture's terrible. Don't even show it again. The picture is terrible. Um, so I justified something that I, in my heart of hearts, knew I should not have done, um, and I give a silly example there, just, just to be funny, but I think a lot of us have found ourselves in different times justifying something that we've done in our life. We find ourselves, like the Corinthians, they knew the gospel, Paul had been there, Paul had preached to them, Paul had discipled them, but we so often find ourselves justifying what we've done. And in the same way, uh, and I might touch on this later, but I I wanted to make, I wanted to at least highlight it here, especially in the context of what this passage talks about um, in terms of sexual immorality. Um, There are, I know people that have been hurt by that, and and I don't want to make any light of that at all, because I know that's a real, real issue. And do I believe that the Lord wants to bring healing and redemption and restoration in your life? Yes. But do I make any light of that in your life? No, uh, by no means. And so and I think when I, so when I say this, that I think the Lord wants to bring healing, I understand the complexity, I understand the emotional weight, and I understand the difficulty of even opening up yourself to process that sometimes. Uh, and there are qualified Christian counselors and people that you should walk with that can process that and grow you because the Lord doesn't want you to stay in that. And I'm so sorry for those who have been sinned against that way. God wants to bring restoration. So I don't make any light of that uh, in this passage and in this context of sexual immorality. And so, um, but like I said at the beginning, I think there is this, Paul uses this example of what's happening in the church of sexual immorality to prove a point that he wants them to grasp. And so really this isn't a sermon about sexual immorality. That just happens to be the context by which Paul uses to communicate his message. What Paul wants them to know and what he's communicating is how important your physical body is. That's what he's trying to communicate. And he's using the example and he's using the, the context that they're in of sexual immorality which is happening in their congregation that they are justifying. And yes, he's, he, he gets at that in other contexts, but what he really wants them to know and what he uses that as an opportunity to do is to tell them, yes, why sexual immorality should not happen, but primarily because of the value that God places on the body. And so, uh, Paul, I'm going to walk through five reasons here why Paul, what Paul has to say about why we should value our physical body why we should value our physical body because we often unintentionally can kind of come to this conclusion that God's more interested in my spiritual life. God's more interested in renewing my mind and my thoughts and taking my thoughts captive 
Those are all those things are all true. But God's maybe you're like God's more interested in getting my emotions in check because maybe you're like I'm a highly emotional person, which is really all of us. It just means you're aware enough to know you are. Um, and we're all emotional, but we often leave out that God cares about our physical body. And what and Paul walks through five reasons here why the body is important and why we should not make a light of our physical body. And so if the first one he says, he says after, he says this, however, the body is not for sexual immorality, but the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Your body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. He's really kind of countering their, their thought earlier of how Food is for the stomach, and stomach is for the food. That was their justification um, for living a sexually immoral life. But Paul says, no, 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 your body, your physical body, in your physical form, the way you are right now, was created and designed for the Lord. To experience the Lord, to know the Lord, to encounter the Lord, to be used by the Lord in your physical form, as well as the Lord is for you. And often you'll hear people say it's, there's a God-sized hole in you until you know Jesus. And most people say that spiritually speaking, which they're not incorrect in that thought, but physically your body is renewed by Christ when you are saved, and there's an element, and we'll get to it in a little bit, of the coming of Christ where we have a new body. And so the body is not for sexual morality. That just happens to be the context that Paul's talking about. You could fill that in with any other thought. The body is not for blank but it's for the Lord. The Corinthians had this tension with Paul because they did not place value on their physical body, and therefore they were justifying acts that were hurting their body. Second one that Paul says in this text, God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. And Paul puts this in really intentional emphasis that God raised up Jesus physically. He's wanting them to grasp this idea. Jesus physically rose from the grave. And often we don't think about how Jesus physically rose. We just think how he took sin and he died and he rose again. Uh, but he physically, in his physical, new, resurrected form, raised to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we, in the same way, are going to be raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. Your physical body the body that Jesus, God, gave you, created you in, is going to be renewed and raised to life by God. The same power that raised Jesus is going to raise you. And the Corinthians here did not have a proper understanding about the coming of Jesus and the resurrection on the final day. They were missing, and in Greek thought, it makes sense why they thought this, in Greek thought, the physical body was of no value, and the mental and the philosophical, intellectual was what really mattered in their culture. And so they had a really hard time grasping what Paul was saying, because they're like, my physical body doesn't matter. All that matters is intellectual and spiritual. And I think sometimes we find ourselves thinking the same thing, when in reality, the end of the day, whether you pass or we're alive when Jesus comes back, your physical body is going to be raised to life in Jesus. And therefore, your physical body has value, and God cares about your physical body. Paul wants us to make the connection between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the believers, because our body is connected to Christ, which leads to the third point. He says, don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? Now, obviously, on some level, he's speaking spiritually here because we're not all literally attached to Christ's body right now. That would be very weird. Um, but Paul wants us to grasp that when we have come to say yes to Jesus, we have entered into the body of Christ. We have entered in as believers, and therefore, what we do with our physical body is an expression of Christ's body. Therefore, the way you act with your physical body is a representation of Christ's body in that situation because you are a part of the body of Christ. We cannot think that sin, whether it's sexual sin or any sin, is okay because one day God is going to destroy our body. 
the reality is that God cares deeply about our body and it represents Christ, the body of Christ. The fourth one, he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And if I had more time, I would jump into the whole history of how God has been moving closer and closer to humanity through the tabernacle, through the temple, through Jesus coming, through the Holy Spirit moving into us. And what it looks like now is that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. God has been moving closer and closer to his people, and he dwells in your physical body. You physically have the Holy Spirit in you when you say yes to Jesus. You are physically being regenerated by the Holy Spirit throughout your whole life, and therefore, take care of your body, because it is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the fifth one, he says, you are not your own, you are bought at a price. And this thought can be easily taken in a negative way. I think we have a natural, a negative association with this idea of like being bought. But what, what Paul's getting at there, he's really getting at how valuable our body is because Christ laid down his life for you. That your physical body, you and who you are, not just your spirit, Jesus values so much. He came and he lived and he died for and he rose and went back to heaven for you in every aspect of who you are. And he says, you are not your own, you were bought at a steep price. And if Christ valued you that much, how much should you value your body and who you are? And so Paul ends, and I'll I'll wrap up with this, Paul ends with then glorify God with our bodies. And so what is it, what will it look like for you in your life to live and to glorify God with your body? to live into who he's calling you to be, who he's making you to be, who he is destining you to be spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. God has a plan for you. God cares about you. So we take care of our body. I'll wrap up for the sake of time. I cut out so many notes. You're welcome. Um, I want to get you out of here on time. Uh, let Pray with me. God, I thank you that you care about us in every aspect, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And so God, we hear your word, and we say, yes, God. We want to glorify you with our body. Holy Spirit, would you empower us to walk that out? Would you empower us to be those people, to represent the life that God is calling humanity, and God, we are a mirror and a representation of that to the world. So would you give us humility and grace and strength, Holy Spirit, to do that well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.